Well, our next session is uh, very interestingly titled Out of the Closets, Optimizing Network Closets and Small Data Centers. And uh, we have a sponsor for this session. And who else is a sponsor for this one? pg and &E <laughs> wants to get you out of the closets. Very appropriate for California. Uh, we have three speakers here, and uh, I will be moderating. I have an opening slides, few of them. What we will do is we'll go over a few slides initially to set the stage for discussion. And it's going to be very interactive. We are hoping that you will ask questions so we can address those questions. And uh, maybe the answers are not with us. The answers may lie within you guys. So please feel free to provide your input. Uh, you have the speaker bios of each one as put in the back of the page here. So please feel free to look at that. But we. Uh, I am from EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute. It's a nonprofit research institute in the Bay Area, primarily funded by electric utilities. Jerry Meek, he is with Genentech, one of the largest uh, uh, biotechnology companies. That's correct. Thank you. And Ralph Rene is with Network Appliance. They are one of the big storage, uh, IT storage equipment companies. And who doesn't know Google? We have uh, Joyce from uh, Google, from the sustainability area. So. Let me start very quickly and give you a little set of the stage for discussion related to the closets and data centers. I'll see if it works. Yep. So first thing is data centers come in all sizes and shapes. If you really talk about it, how many data centers are there, it depends on how you count them. They can be as small as a small IT lab with a small one rack or few equipment there or it could be as big as the one that you've heard about with hundreds of megawatts, big, very, very large data centers. So there was a study done back in 2006 that looked into these data centers classified into different categories, network closets, what they call server closets. They had the server rooms, which are slightly larger. They may have their dedicated cooling systems. To the localized data center or small data centers, we used to call them IT labs in different names to call them. Take the mid-tier data centers, which are larger, typically 5,000 square foot, between 1,000 to 5,000 square foot. And then there are something called enterprise-level data centers, which are even larger, more than 5,000 square foot. And now there's another category, which is called hyper data center, which are even bigger than that. So here's a small picture about different things that you may have seen in terms of what the data center equipment look like. Just wanted to bring out one thing there you know, the small closets all the way to very large data centers. But this is a new thing that has come up. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me know. Uh, Joyce brought it to my attention. Is this called, uh, have you heard about data center in a container? It was started back some years ago. You will have a, a shipping container that will be converted into a data center with all the IT equipment. But this one goes even further. This one goes into a small data center in a, in a rack. And it's a big company that you probably know of, Amazon, that is pushing for these small data centers on the edge. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on in this area. So you could see data centers and network rooms. And this could easily be a, cl a closet. It could be a closet. They're thinking about putting it outside the building, inside the building, anywhere it can go. Uh, it can do the job. So what happens is, if you look at the history of energy consumption in data centers, is growing rapidly. We have heard since morning here in a couple of different presentations that the energy consumption in the US has been pretty much stabilized. If you really look at it, electricity use has been plus minus 1% kind of a thing going up there. But when you look at data centers, it's growing very rapidly. If you look at it, it's going from 60 billion kilowatt hours to 91 currently, you know, two years ago. It's estimated to go to 140. I think the component rate uh, increase is about 8% a year. So this is a growing area, and this is a challenging area that we are all trying to address and see how we can, we can uh, address the uh, increase in the consumption. And when you look at it, the energy consumption, where it goes in terms of size of data center, I looked at this data that was published in 2011, and if you look at it, about 13% of the energy consumption they consider goes into a network type of data centers, very small data centers. But there are so many of them that they consume energy. And about 16% goes into what they call server rooms, between 200 square foot to about 1,000 square foot. Uh, about, uh, sorry, 200 to 500 square foot. This is about 500 to 1,000 square foot, about 18%. 
16% goes into 1,000 to 100, 5,000, and about 37% goes into a larger energy consumption. Although the number of data centers are small, but since they're very, very large, the consumption is fairly high. And we are, although we'll be discussing primarily in terms of what can we do in the small areas where the performance is uh, not as efficient as in the large data centers, but some of, the, some of the things we'll talk about can certainly be used in all the data centers today. Here's another chart that comes up from different source. About the same area, which talks about the energy consumption in different uh, locations. If you look at it, they say about 49% of energy consumption uh, gets into small and medium data centers, and uh, about very high performance compute facilities use about very small energy consumption, about 1%, but they are very, very energy intensive and very large in terms of sizes. So that tells you the amount of energy consumption that is taking place in the data center that we are trying to address in this particular seg uh, segment here. So now let's talk about where the energy is consumed in data centers or in IT equipments, uh, small server rooms. You think about it, there are only two places the energy is consumed. One of them is conditioning the power. You want to make sure the power is uh, uninterrupted supply takes place, there's a distribution losses that take place, so that's on the IT side of it, and on the power delivery side of it. And the second part is the cooling part of it, how the, the equipment is being cooled. So when I was looking at the equipment cooling, I came up with a stack of uh, energy, how the heat is generated and how the heat is removed from the data centers. And this is, comes to about, have you heard about six degrees of freedom? It's like a six to seven degrees of freedom in terms of each component that transfers energy, you know, heat from one to another loop, other loop to third loop, third loop to the fourth loop, until the air, the heat gets out into the ambient air. So think about it, the chip converts the heat, transfers the heat to the room air, through server fans. From the room air, it circulates over a cooling coil, set of cooling coil that transfers the heat to the cooling medium. If it's a chilled water system, it goes to chilled water that transfers the heat through a pump to a chiller. Chiller then transfers it to a compressor to a height section of the heat, you know, condenser section. From the condenser section, it goes to water, the loop that water carries it over to the cooling tower. In the cooling tower, then you have a fan that takes the heat away. And you don't really need to have all the six degrees of uh, transmission there. Sometimes you can take the outside air directly and dump the air out, heat outside. So it basically depends on, you can bypass some of the steps very, very efficiently. Sometimes you are not able to. If you are located in the interior of a building, you do not have any access to the outside air, how are you going to remove the heat? There are different ways to do that. So there are different, you know, in these areas, when I looked at it, because every time you transfer the heat, there's the energy consumption that takes place. The energy required to move the heat through pump, to a compressor in a chiller system, through a cooling tower fan, or the indoor air fan. So I was looking at the energy consumption some time ago and looked at the data that was collected by our friends at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. They did a few data centers and very closely monitored the energy consumption in each component where the energy was going. And then I looked at the number, the range is there. So if you think about it, a data center generally defined efficiency by what is called power utilization effectiveness. And I believe all of you know about what is PUE. A power utilization effectiveness is a very simple criteria. It looks at how much is the energy going to the total facility divided by how much of the energy is going only to the IT equipment, the ratio of that. So it's always going to be more than one because you have a total facility energy divided by the IT energy, and total power or energy includes your uh, IT equipment, of course, then power distribution losses, airflow losses, uh, circulation pumps, chillers, circulation from the condenser water, cooling tower fans, or heat rejection fans. So they are all combined together, and typically you will find the PUE, an ideal, you expect it, you know, want it to be equal to one. Everything goes to your IT equipment, you do not want to waste anything for transferring heat to anything else. But what is the real scenario? We'll talk about that in a second, but I wanted to look at the show, share with you the information that I analyzed the data, and I looked at the energy consumed by each of the component of this heat transfer and divide that by the IT energy. So think about it component of PUE. 
what all constitute to the PUE. These are the power de delivery losses, is the airflow losses, or airflow energy consumption, it's the chiller consumption, it's the pump consumption. When I broke it down, I found some very interesting in information. The power losses were going in between something like 78% uh, on the lower side to a high end of about 24%. But when you start looking into the newer technologies, which is rotating type of UPS, energy consumption went down, so you could see something like only 4% losses. Look at the fan side, I would have noticed was very, very interesting. We saw fans that were using as low as 7% uh, of the IT energy consumption on the lower end, and as much as 42%. And this is the data from the real data centers. And then when we looked into something more development later on, this energy consumption even went down to something like 3 to 4% in some of the case studies. So there's a huge range here, and that's the range we can talk about and see what can you reduce, the, how can you improve the performance of your uh, data centers. Similarly, if, they did, you know, if your system is cooled by a chilled water plant, how much your chiller pump uses, what the amount of energy used by chillers. Chillers use quite a bit of energy. On the lower end is 0 0.20, on the higher end is about 0.45 kilowatt per kilowatt of IT power. Your cooling towers use energy. If you do not have a chiller system, you have a direct expansion cooling system with water cooled. This is the type of ranges you see, or you have an air-cooled system directly. You can see what kind of energy it uses there. And that gives us an idea. It's very helpful because when we later on start to analyze it, we can see where the energy is being used and how can we arrest them or try to fix them. <coughs> OK, so this is a very interesting report I just came across. Uh, it's a very recent one. It says two-thirds of the in-house facilities, which is in-house data centers, not dedicated data centers, have a PUE of over 2.0. It's a Gartner report that came out very recently. And 10% of them have a PUE of three, th uh, three or over, or they do not know about it. So this basically tells you a large number of these facilities are not functioning the way you want them to be. Because there was also another interesting uh, document that came out very recently from White House, which is saying, set up a target for the government facilities in data centers saying, keep your PUE below 1.5 1.5 your existing data centers. And for new data centers, target between 1.2 to 1.4. And that all the data centers in government facilities have to be monitored by the year 2018, so that they can really monitor the PUE and report on the PUE. There's also another lot of effort going on on the government side too, so they have come up with something called a better buildings challenge for data centers, which is very interesting. They say, you sign up with us. We want you to give you all the credit about doing the good job, but you have one requirement. You commit to improve the PUE of your data center by at least 25% over the next five years of a single facility. And when they say PUE, they really mean PUE minus one. That's the support power part of it. Think about it. All the support power, if you reduce by 25%, in five years, they'll become a part of the program. Or if you have multiple data centers, we'll give you 10 years, and we'll also reduce down your uh, target to only 20%. So these uh, numbers, 1.5 for existing data centers, is not a bad number that for the private industry to pick up to. Think about that. And what we're going to talk about, hopefully, will help you address, address this, how you could do that. Opportunities are very simple. On the IT side of it, we, we you know, probably heard about all these things many number of times. You do a server consolidation, virtualization, so that you have fewer, fewer equipment doing the so more work. How many of you heard about the data centers, the utilization is very, very low? Something like in the number single digits or sometimes 10%, 20%. So if you do a consolidation, it will help you improve the performance. You use a high efficiency server fans. This is something I have not heard about it lately. But um, if you, this is more of a, not only server fans, but also in terms of power uh, conversion device, your power supplies. There are now Eco plus 80%. They have gone to platinum, uh, platinum uh, performance, which is running into a range of about 95%, 97% efficient in power conversion, can really save you. This energy savings feature on your IT equipment, you're going to sleep mode, like your laptop does. 
Um, on the infrastructure side, you have airflow management. We talked about how much it consumes. Uh, your airflow quantity, we find it much more energy and much more air quantity used in data center than it needs to. I have come across places where you are blowing three, four, four hundred times, uh, or three to four times the airflow that you needed there. Conditions of air, you know, cold is old kind of a thing. I just heard, just heard about that. You don't need to keep data centers very cold. They can run in the warm conditions. The IT equipment uh, can withstand higher temperatures. Using the direct air from outside or indirectly through your chilled water loop or refrigeration loop, there are different ways for you can uh, use it more efficiently. And in fact, if you look at Cali a CEC or the California Energy Commission Title 24, now mandates you to use uh, economizers uh, in a certain situations. You can run the chiller system. They don't have to run to a standard temperature for human comfort cooling. They can run at a warmer temperatures. And also, most important thing I find here is create some dashboards for continuous monitoring, have the, have the benchmarks, and measure its performance against the benchmarks. And if it is not functioning, try to fix it up right then and there so that improvement performance will be improved. That's basically the areas that we will think we'll talk more about it. At this time, I'll pass on my in, to our friend uh, Jerry Meek. He'll talk about few technologies on the data in the cooling side. I'm going to focus really on the IT closets themselves and really how they've evolved over the period of time and what we at Genentech have done over the last uh, 39 years. Genentech started 39 years or so ago in South San Francisco. And uh, we're not so much of a small company anymore. We have 12,500 employees in South San Francisco, well over 60 buildings. We have manufacturing, research and development, administrative functions um, for Genentech. Plus, also our parent company, Roche, has activities there in South San Francisco. So our growth has been phenomenal. So you can imagine with the evolution of data, computer rooms, server rooms, and our growth at the same time. We've had a lot of fluctuation and a lot of change. Well, the expression that uh, cool is old is definitely the case because when we started building these data centers and server rooms many, many years or so ago, really the focus was is truly making an air conditioning unit dedicated to these small applications. Five to 10 ton units, you would have something up on the roof, you know, as far as your condenser units, you'd have a little small fan coil with the refrigerant or you would have the unit in the space. Um, you know, they were a lot of work, a lot of maintenance. And we kept these rooms at 68 degrees. And, um, but we kept moving them around. The remodels in these buildings, the addition, we need more server closets, great. We're on the first floor, this is a five-story building. How are we gonna get all the lines from the roof all the way down to the first floor? So we had to do something because we didn't have chases in all these rooms, or these spaces, to put the piping from the roof all the way up to the, uh, to the area itself. In addition to this is um, you know, when we were acquired by Roche in 2008-2009 uh, is we had a requirement that was given to us is you're going to need to phase out of all halogenated refrigerants. Well, we got well over 100 server rooms just in South San Francisco alone, and all of them have this type of system. So we had to look at something that would be far different than your conventional refrigeration system. We had to look at something that was going to be mobile to the point where we could change the location, something that other than just a little move and cool portable units, which were really not something that was a long-term solutions. So with that, we looked at a couple of different applications. Um, first was we got the approval to go to 75 to 76 degrees. That was huge. By being able to do that at a constant temperature allowed us to do some things we would never have been able to do before as far as natural ventilation. The first is, is that water is a great refrigerant, okay? Evaporative cooling has been around for well over 100 years. It's very prevalent in areas that, uh, of the world that um, is very hot and dry. But so, well, why not we use this for data centers and use it for server rooms? Because they're small, you could pull room from, you know, air from the adjacent area, from the room itself, and then cool these spaces. 
But before we put our first one in, we went to, uh, to Colorado and visited in uh, Boulder the National Snow and Ice um, location where they have their big data center there. That entire data center is cooled with evaporative cooling. I said, wow, I was really impressed. And then we went up to, to NCAR up in Wyoming, which is one of the world's largest data centers when it was built. It doesn't have any, any compression cooling. It's all evaporative cooling throughout. And then I looked at the PUEs and looked at their energy consumption. It says, this is definitely a ticket you know, for us. So we've installed these in a few locations. We're very, very happy with them. We've had them in, in operations for, for well over a year with basically almost no maintenance on those other than filter replacements. Well, this is maybe not an application for all locations because it does take some space. If you have a little dinky room, you don't have enough room to put this, what are you gonna do? So we have a lot of office buildings that where we turn the HVAC off at night and after hours, but there's still heat going on, heat generation within these areas. We don't want to run the entire house system for these little IT closets. So what we physically have done is looked at a, at a program of basically utilizing the surrounding air in the environment and the building as a big heat sink is that um, we put exhaust fans in, we put in some little transfer fans. So we've taken, during the day when the AC unit is, is working, we provide cooling to those spaces via the house air. Then after hours on the time clock, when the house air system is physically off, what we physically do is then we turn an exhaust fan on that pulls air from an aisle or pulls air from the interstitial space, and then that fan air with that hot air is then evacuated to a surrounding area. It could be you know, back into the corridor, it could be above the ceiling, it could be a different part of the building, or even the exhaust system. In South San Francisco, if you know, you've been there in the summertime, it gets pretty cold. You know, so actually what has been interesting, and especially in the winter months, this actually helps heat the building up a little bit you know, with the IT. So we reuse that heat to go back into the building. A benefit we were not anticipating, but was a pleasant surprise. So these are some of the evolutions that we have taken, you know, and we're still in the process of uh, going through these rooms one by one. So with this, we've been able to reduce our energy consumption in these spaces by about 80% for the cooling, just by using either the water refrigerant or the air movement, because there's no uh, refrigeration base, there's no compression, compressors, which are big users of energy. And on top of that, the benefits of having a lot lower maintenance and meeting the requirements that we have of our parent company to phase out of all halogenated refrigerants. So it's been a win-win situation, I'm pleased, and, but we've still got a long ways to go. And being portable, this is nice. As we change locations for these IT closets, especially in the lab buildings, we've been able to, uh, to implement these really quickly without having to disrupt other floors and such. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ralph. Thank you, Jerry. Good afternoon. So I'm going to talk more or less the same things that Jerry just discussed. NetApp's got, according to the definitions Mukesh put up, we've got about 15 enterprise class data centers. And over the course of many years, in fact, NetApp was an early adopter of AirSight Economizer, we've had very good PUEs on almost every data center we built. Um, back in 2004, we had our first production data center on site in Sunnyvale, and we have a PUE of about 1.35 in that facility. But in 2004, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody employing airside economizer. So over the course of the years, we've improved our data center practice. And uh, the last facility we built out in Raleigh, in the Raleigh climate, we could still achieve a PUE of about 1.14 not quite as extreme as some of these other companies like Google and <laughs> Facebook and others have reported, but really achieving uh, fantastic PUEs from just conventional, traditional mechanical systems, nothing exotic, and, and no excessive extreme temperatures. 
most of our data centers are pretty dynamic and we don't have a lights out facility at all. It's really more lights dim in the, the enterprise data centers that have corp IT, but all the other data centers are, are rack and stack environments and configurations going all the time. We've got big groups of people in that data center. So we, we, we recognize the fact that we can't drive to extreme uh, supplier temperatures. Uh, as an equipment manufacturer, our spec uh, allows you to run NetApp equipment 24-7 at 40C with 104F. So clearly we know that the equipment can operate in much higher temperatures, but it's really the human factor that limits us from uh, delivering air at those extreme temperatures because we've got people in the space. And, and consequently, we deliver about 76 degree with about a 15 degree delta T. So somewhere in about 91 uh, degree environments our people are having to work with. Uh, having said that, you could say, all right, the, the practice of enterprise data center, there's just so much information that, you know, the mechanical systems, electrical systems, they're quite advanced, and anybody who's out building a data center today will probably employ all the best practices, and, and no one goes, builds a new data center with a, you know, objective of a, a PUE of 2.0. It's, it's unheard of now. But what is uh, not really being addressed are all of these network closets. So this is just a typical closet that we have. Uh, in our Sunnyvale campus, we have about 1.6 million square feet and 12 buildings. If I add up all the floors, I've got 37 rooms of these. Most of our uh, network closets are really just doing the IT uh, network wired connectivity as well as the, the wireless. Uh, access points. So all the APs are served off these switches as well as all the desktop connections. Quite simple, it's just a cabling hub with a couple big Cisco switches. In our case, we use a uh, 6500 series Cisco Catalyst switch, uh, dual power supply. There are about two and a half K, three K loads in each of these rooms. Depending on what size the floor is, it, it kind of varies. But what's ubiquitous about the network closets is you could almost say in every 40,000 square foot area, one of these closets exists. And that's mainly because of the structured cabling limitations of the 300, uh, 330 feet or 100 meter cabling distance limitations. So this, this happens everywhere, uh, whether you're a high tech company or a law firm or any other organization that operates any kind of a business generally has a network closet. So you can imagine throughout the US and the world, there are millions and millions of these network closets. In our real estate where we're multi-tenant, and we may have a small footprint, 20,000 square feet on a 50,000 square foot floor, we may have four different neighbors. Each one of our neighbors has one of these closets in it. So you could just see how it kind of perpetuates and, and there's so many network closets out there in comparison to enterprise level data centers that maybe there is a bigger opportunity here. So this is just our typical spec. We roughly have about 600 ports, as I mentioned, 6,500 series, 3K load. We, we're sort of a Starline bus house and we do this for redundancy. So we have an AB bus. One is uh, backed up by UPS. The other is a house power, allows us to do some maintenance and, and it's always 24 by seven load uninterrupted. Um, most of the network closets run 24 by seven. The switches may idle down, but nobody turns them off. And, and no IT shop wants to turn these switches off and run the risk of ports expanding and, and blades cooling off and heating up and then causing some outages. So um, these by and large in every facility in every office building are 24 by seven loads. Our design used sort of a, a backup system because in the event the house air were to fail, we still don't want to shut these rooms down. So we've got a primary cooling in the form of a fan coil unit and, and an exhaust fan for backup. The fan coil unit is the primary coolant. Um, most of our buildings are chill water, so these are chill water fan coil units, but they could be any, you know, air-cooled DX, uh, it, you, you generally have a primary cooling system. The exhaust fan is not necessarily typical, but we install them because these rooms continue to generate heat. Even in, the, in a power outage when our house fan systems are off, they're generating heat. So we put in an exhaust fan. 
And um, this is just kind of the typical equipment design that we employ. But what we do have is a relatively small exhaust fan and compared to the fan coil unit. Um, but what we discovered, which is, uh, I think, interesting, in our case, it was our benefit. We have a primary coolant in the form of a fan coil unit chill water. In the off hours, there's virtually no demand on the chiller except when the network closet hits its temperature and it calls the chiller on. And now we've got a large chiller coming on to serve a very small load. And over a period of time, we notice we have calls on our chillers, 500 calls per year with very few run hours against that chiller. So the office building's got a standard economizer. The chiller runs about eight hours a day. And yet we're starting the chiller about six times a day uh, for a, an eight hour run time. So what we had decided to do is just with no investment at all, just simply change mode of operation. If we took this exhaust fan and made that primary coolant over the non-occupied hours when the house systems are off and the chiller is off and use the fan coil unit as the backup, that allowed us to leverage an asset that we used for emergency and, and just simply change the mode of operation and put the exhaust fan as primary coolant. That exhaust fan is just pulling air out of the mezzanine or interstitial space, uh, but it's not extremely hot air. It, you know, our, our return air temperatures in the office are 76 degrees. It's 76 degree air we're pulling out and we're relying on the building's thermal mass as the cooling medium during the unoccupied hours. So that just simple change in operation allowed us to shut off these fan coil units during unoccupied hours and then eliminate runtime on the chiller, which resulted in um, percentage-wise some significant saving. Again, these are small loads, but it afforded us about $100,000 a year annual savings just in this strategy alone. And I'm just speaking for the, the Sunnyvale campus. Um, we don't have this uniformly in every single facility. In our lease facilities, uh, depending on the generation, this spec wasn't necessarily employed. Um, but we are standardizing to this type of solution where we can. The, the discussion earlier, uh, just to point out, we, we do, in our case, we do cold out containment. We leverage outside air. This is just a simple diagram that shows how you can use outside air for primary cooling in a data center. And we've quite honestly been pioneers in this and, and kind of perfected the uh, state of the art for airside economizers. It's really our uh, primary design. What um, came to mind is in new construction, we brought on the idea of, well, you know, why do we treat network closets different than data centers where in fact they're really just small data centers? And what we had done this is, uh, because this was new construction, allowed us to put an air shaft through the building we essentially have uniform floor plates in the IDF closet on each floor. By design, we made them direct stacks on top of each other. So in a five-story building, all of our IDFs are, have complete vertical alignment, which then allowed us to run an air shaft without too many turns and minimize static air from, from duct work. But what it did also do is allow us to put a rooftop unit, bring in outside air to cool these 24 by 7 loads. Uh, so in new construction, you get to you know, have the benefit of applying some new technology. And uh, with that, we took a look at, well, one thing we do do is outside air. So this is kind of a crude diagram. But what we he did here is we, we took a standard rooftop unit, this train, but we put a, a Munters evaporative coil on it. This is a direct evap and train and Munters partner. So it's, uh, it's not a train component, but you can get the package ordered together. In addition to that, this just shows an outside air damper. So it allows us to go ahead and bring in outside air as primary cooling, leverage free cooling. The only thing we've got is fan energy. The secondary mode of cooling is uh, evaporative cooling. And when our temperatures exceed uh, 75 degrees, we'll bring on the evaporative cooler. And above 80 degrees, then we'll have to go into mechanical cooling. But that Evaporative cooler kind of bridges that space where outside air doesn't quite support it. I'm sorry, 65 degrees is our uh, outside air threshold. So 65 to 80 is where the evaporative cooler and then it goes to full mechanical coolant. But it was just another way to really start focusing in on um, 
rooms that are out there all over the place, but no one really ever focused in on it. Uh, the most traditional way is a split system where you've got an air handler and a, a DX condenser, and it's one of the most expensive ways to cool a space, relatively cheap in terms of the HVAC equipment, but highly inefficient. So this is just one more view of just what could be done, uh, taking sort of the data center design practice and applying it to network closets. So that kind of ends my discussion. And Joyce, why don't you take over? Okay. So I'm Joyce Dickerson. Uh, this is Google. The Doppel server closets. No, the closet server. So I'm Joyce Dickerson. I'm currently um, I lead data center sustainability for Google globally. And prior to this position, I was actually at Stanford and led an initiative called Sustainable IT. So I'm actually going to start with a, some of the work that I did at Stanford around server closets and then um, let you know about some of the work that was done at Google to that front. Um, so back in. But I can. You got to advance with the you got to advance with the PC, I think. Do I? There we go. So back when I was at Stanford, this was back in 2008. We were looking at our IT for infrastructure, and there was this comment that there were actually server rooms all over the place. And it turns out there are about 100, at least 100 of them that we counted. And you sort of wonder, how do you find these things? And the way we found them was by walking around buildings and like listening, putting our ear to the door and feeling doors and you know tr trying to find them. So we cataloged them. And we said, you know, is there something we can do to reduce the energy? Because um, we think they're using a lot of energy, but we really don't know. So. I um, put together a team with the facilities group here, and we cataloged all these server rooms in terms of what were the different cooling systems that we were using to, um, to cool these systems. And we put together a study to look at how efficient these were to see you know, if they really were a problem or not. Do we need to move them to the central data center or not? So we found that, um, and as you can see, we, they came in various, various shapes and sizes. This one here is just a server closet. The bottom one there is actually a dedicated room. It's a big cinder block building. And the one up top shows it was in, a, they took a conference room and stuck, put a um, contained hot aisle cooling system, sort of plunked it in the middle and ran a bunch of high performance computing off of it. So here's, here's what we found. And um, the, the five different um, server room <laughs> types that we looked at, the first was the closet, which was a picture I showed there. It had a fan coil and a house system, so kind of a typical um, situation you find in a lot of buildings. The second one um, we call grow, growing high density. They'd put in these great high density, super efficient racks, but they only had 41 kilowatts of load, because, and it could have gone up to about 200 kilowatts. So they actually um, had a lot of stranded cooling capacity there. The third one was the cinder block building, which was 100% IT gear run by a DX system. The fourth was the bottom floor of one of the buildings here where a bunch of engineering and CS folks had put all their compute infrastructure in kind of a haphazard way. So they had raised floor, but there was no containment, no nothing. The air was blowing as hard as you could imagine. And the last one was the conference room where they dropped one of these um, hot aisle containment, self-contained systems into it. And what we found was pretty interesting is certainly the loads, as you look across, varied greatly. And the ITER watts per square foot varied greatly, including the 278 kilowatts per square foot down at the right hand. But what we really focused in on was what was the PUE of each of these? How efficient were they really? Well, they were all pretty not so efficient. Um, the, you know, the, the fan coil closet was at 2.36, and they were calling us and saying, hey, we need more cooling because we're starting to you know, burn out what we've got here. The water-cooled racks were at a 2. They should have been down at like a 1.2 if they'd been fully loaded. The DX unit was actually doing pretty well. And so the idea, if you take a cinder block building with no you know, a way for air to escape, it, you can actually run a pretty efficient facility that way. The raised floor with a cry unit um, was over three. Actually, kind of, someone pointed out later that it's 3.14, and this was the um, CS building, little <laughs> pie relation. <laughs> that was purely coincident. Uh, but their PUE was 3.14. They had no idea. Um, and, and then the um, high-density one was a 1.27. So actually taking the conference room and dropping one of these 
um, uh, self-contained units and running it at full capacity was actually a really efficient way to run these servers. So obviously for that little group I said, you guys just stay right there. We're not gonna move you to our data center or anything. The other kind of learning we got out of this was um, the percent of the building that was this IT room versus the percent of the energy, the building energy that was used. And typically when the, the energy efficiency team came through, they said, great, we'll you know, redo the lights and the whatnot. That little tiny server closet, we're not gonna pay attention to that because it's only 0.2% you know, of, the, of the building. We're gonna do the lights and the HVAC system and whatnot. And you know, the first one, like it's just a closet, 0.2% of the square footage of the floor, but it was 7% of the energy use. And no one had really thought about uh, how do we drive that down. Um, the one that I like is the one on the far right. It was only 2.7% of the square footage, but it was 41% of the building energy use. And on that one, when we mapped it to our energy rates here, it was $260,000 per year in electricity that they had no idea they were paying because the building didn't pay it and the faculty member didn't pay it. The, the school paid it. So that was a, an electricity bill that was just sort of lost in the, um, in the infrastructure. So there was no motivation for them to think about it either. But once we ran these numbers on how much it costs to run them, people, the, the people the, who were actually paying the electricity bill started to pay attention. Like, oh, I'm spending $70,000 a year to run this building, or in the case of the little closet one, $20,000 a year. Just as a little note on this closet one, when they were telling us they needed more cooling, we went in and looked at how they had lined up the cooling. And granted, this is 2009 when it was kind of early on data center sustainability stuff or server rooms. They had, they had the, a closet with the, a rack of servers. So you had the hot, sort of the hot side and the cool side. So the facilities people came in and put the fan coil blowing the cold air into the hot side because it's hot and you have to cool it, right? <laughs> so obviously that didn't work. So we came in and all we did was move the duct to the cool aisle and suddenly their cooling was just fine. But it just shows that, you know, you just can't take for granted that all these things are done correctly. Um, so what about Google? So, um, so now I moved to Google. It's uh, 2011 when I went. These are our data centers. We have hundreds of people focused on energy efficiency of data centers. I'm not even going to go there. They're all great. But after they heard my talk about these server rooms at another conference, they said, huh, we have a bunch of these network closets in our data center spaces. We spent all this time and energy, time optimizing our data centers, and we're just throwing in the, the, the network closet um, pieces. So we haven't really looked at that. Maybe there's something there that we should look at. And so indeed, they did. They, took, they looked at our server closets. And being Google, and this was not when I was there, so I can't take no credit, but they, they did a, um, an airflow analysis and realized that you know, all the cool air was actually flying over the servers and going mm -hmm. over here into the cryo units and <laughs> completely that. inefficient. <laughs> so they did a huge retrofit product, they, project. They put containment, um, they put containment around the, 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 the two rows of servers. They put caps on the cryo units to go up to the ceilings to keep the back from happening. And you know, their airflow now works much better and the PUs ease drop significantly. And I share this because at this link right here, um, they did a fabulous, they did what I think is one of the best case studies with kind of a step-by-step -step on how to do this. And more importantly, what on each step of the way, what are your PUE savings and what are the dollar savings associated with it? So if you've got one of these rooms and you're trying to figure out where do we start, there's some immediate improvements that cost you nothing, like adjusting floor tiles, putting in monitors, um, uh, temperature gazers so you can see where the heat's going, play around with your floor tiles. What we did here at Stanford is we got um, the metal strips, like if you put signage on the side of a car. So we got some of those and cut them into floor tile sized. And we would put them around and test out and see how the, um, how the temperatures change. It was a real, it's much easier than pulling and, and moving around floor tiles. We just sort of put these blockers in. Once we'd nailed it, then we swapped out the tiles. But simple things, you can do that, adjusting the temperature and humidity to ASHRAE standards, um, adjusting the crack, crack or the craw controls. That, that was their sort of starting point immediate improvements. That got them a 0.2. They went from a 2.2 to a 2 in terms of um, PUEs. And then they go down. Then they did the cold aisle containment. That got, got them another 0.2 points. Then they did um, the air extensions, and that was actually 0.3 points, so one of the most 
cost-effective things they could do was actually close off the top of your cracks. And then they did some controllers on the cracks. So all of this information is available. If you're interested in um, trying to see some of the numbers behind it, encourage you to look at it. However, it's now 2015, and the world has changed since 2011. <laughs> so, I mean, these guys mentioned some great technologies that they use. What we've gone to at, um, at Google and many companies that I know have sort of switched from a, you know, we just need to get rid of these things. We have very talented people managing our data centers. There's cloud options. Just we need to get the server rooms out of there. So if you can, you know, the main goal is actually to get them out. And this is a study that LBNL did um, last year, I think it was. And they looked at the energy use of you know, running your own stuff versus actually moving it to the cloud. And you can save 87% um, 80, of the energy use. And it's primarily these little bubbles are sort of the energy footprint of the different pieces. <laughs> Once you get it out of your inefficient 2.53.0 PUE data center and into something that the cloud data centers are, which are running at 1.1 you know, or 1.08, or even your own ex corporate data center, which is probably running at a 1.1 or a 1.2, there are huge energy savings to that. And from a um, sort of overall carbon reduction and energy reduction, that's often can be the best way to go. And that's all I have. Thank you. So you please come forward if you have any questions. Uh, you can come to the mic there. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'll go up. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, uh, the power supplies keep getting more efficient and you have 80 plus and 90 plus and uh, what is the standard for Google and, and uh, NetApps now for power supply efficiency that you employ in your server groups or, or, the, or, the, or their closets either way? Are you familiar with those yeah, numbers? Yeah, I'm trying to think what the number is. It is way up there. It's something that we have teams of people working on and continue to work on. So but my it's question over really, 95, I'm sure. My question is self-serving because we have developed a transformer that has no heat, and I don't know how much heat is coming out of your, your uh, out of the power supply versus the chips. Oh, interesting. I don't know, but we'd love to chat with you. Yeah, I mean, Energy Star for servers are available. Not quite for storage, but we tend to buy Energy Star compliant servers. So it's 85 plus. Zero's uh, compelling. Well, <laughs> Always. There's been any studies on chips versus the, the, the transformer inside the power supply. So there's, the chip element is creating heat. Yep. Yep. In the old days, the power supply was pretty hot and has a fan. Yep. Right. So we eliminate the fan so there's less heat. Cool. Mm. Neat. It's awesome. Power supply manufacturer? Soon. <laughs> uh, question for you, Ralph. Uh, on that uh, telecom room, you, you mentioned that the house air now is the backup on those retrofits. Are you having a temperature set uh, on those on your uh, exhaust in those rooms, or how are you managing that? And what temperatures are those telecom rooms reaching? We uh, negotiated with IT. This is actually a great question, Frank, because. Before I got there, they ran them at 70. And right. you go, okay, so only see. cold is old. And we say, well, why 70? <laughs> Nobody's in these rooms, you know? So we were proposing to take it up to 85. The switch will run at 85, 24, 7, 365. There's nothing that prevents us from going even above 85. But IT just like, yeah, that's gonna warm, you know, you're gonna kill our equipment. So we ended up resolving it at 80 degrees. So the cooling actually kicks on at 80. Um, in the occupied hours, the primary cooling is the fan coil, and we run the fan coil and maintain 80 degrees in the room. In the off hours, the same thing. The exhaust fan will just run and try to modulate to 80 degrees. Mm -hmm. We get um, into trouble like on a 4th of July weekend. We're four days, let's say, this, this year doesn't apply, but if we had a four-day shutdown by, in it, in, with weather like we have today, by the end of the fourth day, it's too hot, and we end up having to bring on systems. But in a kind of a standard week um, with the two-day weekend, we we're able to kind of ride through and run the exhaust fan without bringing on primary cooling. Very good. Yeah. 
And Ralph, we do the same as well at Genentech. We have found that just modulating the exhaust fans and having temperature sensors. So if it is already cool enough, let's say if it's a cold winter night or weekend, is not having the house HVAC system on, is that there are times when the exhaust fan is off. But conversely, if it is really warm for that long weekend, is that we have an override so the house system will come on. Right. Very good. Yeah, we do the same. At 85, we bring on house. So can I follow up on the question there, very quick one. Have you come up with any guidelines to say if I have a 50,000 square foot area, how much kilowatt of your uh, server closet can you put on this house type of system that will absorb the heat within the building? Would it be 10 closets of 10 kilowatt each will that uh, carry you through the weekend or would it be like 10 closets of one kilowatt? Well, I guess it all depends on the closet. So in a 50,000 square foot space, we would have roughly one closet or slightly more than a closet. And that's a, you know, in idle mode, it's not even three kW continuous, but maybe two and a half. So we can exhaust the cooling, the thermal mass within that building in probably about 48 hours. Okay. Good number. So 50,000 square foot at three kilowatt for 48 hours is good. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it seems that immersion cooling has a lot of potential for solving a lot of the efficiency issues and airflow and all these you eliminate and, and can be done. I mean, it seems to be tried a few times. What's your experience with it? Have y'all's companies tried it, evaluated it to, for, you know, implementation in your data centers? It, it's... Um we haven't deployed it. We're, we look at everything, and so we have a small team who's looking at it. It's, it's pretty interesting. You have to solve some challenges around, you know, what, what the fluids and how do you change things and how do you stack and kilowatt out, kilowatts per square foot. You know, all of that we're sorting through. But it's, you know, it's something that yeah, we're keeping an eye on. I've seen high density where it you know, performs really well. So I, hmm. I'm just, and the, and the efficiency can be we, we've looked at it, but um, there are form factors that aren't um, really readily available. So you've got to have a sort of a design toward that and, and some real super high compute. I know in uh, Lawrence Livermore, they've done it rather successfully, but uh, I'd still say we're pretty much an off the shelf type IT shop <laughs> and you don't necessarily see it. And, and it's also, you would want a design to it you wouldn't put it in a traditional data center, albeit there's people saying you can retrofit to it, and, but you've already got the investment in standard cooling systems, so you'd have to overcome the impairment and the write-off of those systems to implement new. So we, we've explored it, but we don't really have a, a good application for it. And quite frankly, what, you know, um, <clears throat> Google's doing, we're doing. We're, as much as we can, we'll reduce footprint in our own data center and leverage the cloud. So to start designing towards a, a more efficient cooling system when we're really trying to reduce footprint is, is sort of, you know, counterintuitive. I guess one, one thought of it is why, why aren't people using it for their cloud data center? That's probably where the market is. Well, it seems yeah. To be, I mean, you really want to be big. Yeah. Yeah, and all very custom designed. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just, it's new. Yeah. It's new. Well, I had a question for Jerry about you're using trans, transfer air from adjacent uh, server rooms to cool at night so you can turn off your house air. If, how do you, just to get into the details, we ran into some problems with fire rated walls when we were thinking about doing that and, and just sizing issues. So I'm just wondering what were some of the challenges or ways you worked around different situations with transferring air? Did you transfer to the corridor, to rooms adjacent to the space, or how, how have you done it? It's, it's a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what the corridor, if there are one-hour rated wall you had to go through, and in those cases, you'd have to put a fire damper in there mm -hmm. or a smoke-type uh, fire damper as well um, with a fusible link. But uh, it's an extra cost, but it's far less expensive than having to put dedicated DX systems in and run piping. That localization just of the fans and those applications is, is a big saver. Are you exhausting to an adjacent space, or are these spaces where they had exhaust fans already in the spaces? We're putting in small exhaust fans, particularly for those rooms, and just doing the transfer air. 
We only do that really in our office environments, in a laboratory spaces, um, where we have air 24-7. We just use the house air in those applications. And I guess one more question. Uh, for the network closets, is it possible to move the, those units to the cloud? I thought those had to sort of reside locally in the building. We're trying to get rid of all of our servers, and, 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 and like everybody else is doing, is have it go to the cloud or to our centralized data centers, because IT really wants to get out of the business of, of supporting servers that are in individual closets. So a server isn't different from a network closet in terms of where you exactly. have to live. Okay. We, we, but we still find that people want to put servers you know, for their applications, especially in our research community um, within their areas, because a lot of the servers for the research folks are not supported by IT. because you're buying a piece of equipment with an individual type of computer. And some of the stuff is quite old um, and like, so we really can't make any changes in and, those and, applications. And we are doing that here too. I guess I just was, maybe it was a space that had switches in it and network switches versus servers. There was some, we came across one, what looked like a room full of equipment and we're told, well, that's not something you can move to a central facility because it switches, not servers, so I just was curious. There is a distance for the switches for, okay. for when the user is, so it has to be within a certain distance, what typically I think 300 feet, Ralph? Three, 330, 100 Yeah, or so we keep them within. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but, but that's a great question because switches aren't going away. Even if you go wireless, the, the access points, they're served from switches. So we purged, uh, and my WPR facilities team was probably the, the last to get out of these IDF closets, and <laughs> we got rid of our servers that we kind of stashed in all these closets throughout the buildings. Um, but we pretty much got servers completely out, so there's no real compute. It's just the networking switches, they have to remain. And they're, they're actually going to grow and load. If you really think of Internet of Things, PoE is, you know, power over Ethernet is the future. All of our cameras work on it. Uh, you'll see lighting uh, available today through network switches. Um, so these loads are actually going to grow over a period of time. In fact, uh, you'll, you're going to probably start seeing switches getting bigger with m more robust power supplies mm -hmm. because they're actually distributing DC power now for a variety of applications and also taking the data analytics. So, But the yeah. switches can also run at significantly higher temperature. Yeah. Right. So they can, yeah. they're happy at 85 degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And we just got to make sure that you know we're not still cooling for servers um, in these rooms. And and then the other challenge we found at Stanford is you know once you got a closet, someone throws starts throwing servers in there. <laughs> That's so, the biggest you know, problem. Keeping them out yeah. of there is really exactly. yeah. a challenge. <clears throat> okay. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ellen Petrel with EPRI. Good presentations. Thank you. Really great examples and concrete stuff. Did you work with your utilities on the projects that you were that you did? At Stanford, we did uh, the the retrofits that we did. We absolutely did, and we were dependent upon the incentives to be able to um, get them to happen. Okay. So absolutely. So and, I was going to ask if if you if you guys had advice for utilities to to do outreach to companies. Your your companies are special because you've done some really high powered work and. You did it because of money savings, but some companies might not have staff like you guys to do that kind of thing. Do you have advice for utilities for how to reach the smaller uh, data centers that are integrated data facilities? In the big companies? Well, maybe Small smaller firm. companies or commercial office buildings or the, the hard to reach kind of thing. I'm asked that question quite often by some of our neighbors and other companies. It says, hey, we don't have somebody like you to help us out. Where do we go? And this is where I refer to the actual PG&E representative um, in the local area. And they could reach out to their individuals within PG&E if that's your territory, and they could bring some pe people in to help out. But there's also a group of contractors that are willing to help out too. If they just know um, that there's an opportunity, they could work with the utility provider to help and assist in those designs and get rebates for those jobs. Yeah, we, we leverage PG&E rebates. In fact, uh, on the data center practice, we, we've received a tremendous amount of rebates out of PG&E. And in my experience, the, the, the reps do a good job canvassing. I think what may not get transmitted are these like unique opportunities that Jerry or I have adopted using like exhaust fans for primary cooling. But it is a case-by-case -case basis, so it, it's 
It does require some engineering, but you know, almost every project we do, uh, if there's a, an applicable rebate, we do take advantage of that. Hi, my name is Ronaldo Visaliza with Alisto Engineering, and I have a question for you on the design of these data centers. Some of them, uh, quite a few of them actually, are retrofitted into buildings that are warehouses or, or existing facilities. How do you take into account any passive solutions for cooling, such as wastewater recycling or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, thermal? geothermal solutions uh, when you consider designing them? <laughs> Wastewater recycling, <laughs> it, I mean, it, it certainly can be done. Uh, the contribution in terms of data center efficiency, not necessarily directly linked. Geothermal would be a great opportunity, but there's, you know, a couple, um, I guess, local examples. The NASA Center they punched 300 holes in the ground and I think got about a 50% success rate. So it's conceivable it can be done. I know Google has some geothermal as well, but um, not necessarily you know, the way you'd approach it in a traditional data center design. Conventional cooling using air side economizer still seems to be the simplest. You could achieve a lot with water side economizer. So you know, kind of the loading orders, air side, water side, and then you could do some more exotic things like geothermal or, or just cooling loops buried about 10, 15 feet underground. You can dissipate a lot of heat that way, but it's hard to do in retrofit. And yeah. If you're planning new construction, yeah, you could take your whole foundation and, and do cooling loops underneath, but retrofit, you, you kind of work within the box that you're working with. But what I found when I visited Colorado, Wyoming, this was two years ago in July, and it was 88 degrees when I visited, and seeing three data centers that use exclusively evaporative cooling, I was rather impressed. And, and we're utilizing that on a large scale right now, not just for the purposes of data centers, but also for office areas. Because in this area, our wet bulb temperature is actually quite low. It's quite different than it would be in the East Coast or in the, the south areas. So water could be our friend for, um, for cooling. And what's interesting, people ask me the question, says, well, that takes up a lot of water, right? Well, look how much water it takes to make electricity. And it's actually, it's a net reduction in water consumption. Yeah. I, would say, I would agree on the, for, for new construction and in our sort of large data center designs, we look at, we absolutely look at wastewater. We use uh, industrial water in Belgium, and we use seawater in Finland, and we, put, we actually built a water treatment plant in Atlanta for our cooling. Um, tying the, and then when we design our data centers now, we actually cool the network rooms with the same process water loops that we use for the data center. So I could say, I guess we could say we are cooling with those. Um, but retrofits are tough. <laughs> but but I'm, a, I'm a proponent of evaporative cooling and if you can avoid using potable water for evaporative exactly. cooling, all the better. Uh, because there's a basically a purple pipe system in the South Bay. You know, we're we have seriously explored converting all of our evaporative coolers to recycled water. We wouldn't necessarily have to do wastewater harvesting because the volumes are so Got great. It. The domestic consumption is just too small. But because there is uh, a system that's already providing water for our landscaping. We're looking at tapping that and using it for evaporative coolers. Well, I think we have just uh, exceeded our time. So thank you very much for attending. Let's give a hand to the speakers here.